we are going to central Missouri and we're going to learn about the running dogs. You guys have listened to me on the podcast before. You know that uh, several of my dogs have come from Mike Kemp and they have a running dog in them. In fact, all three of three of my my camp dogs have quarter quarter running dog, three quarter tree and walker in them. So this is going to be a learning experience for me, and I can't wait to find out the ins and outs. And we're actually going to do a little competition hunting. And no, Josh Michaelis, we are not going to be coon hunting. We are going to be dogging, and we're going to be yote. We I call them yotes. Harold, I don't know how what you call them, but I call them yotes. And I've had some dogs that are scared as yotes. <laughs> but today I've got Harold Owens on from Central Missouri, and I'm just going to Howard, Howard. Howard. Yeah, it's my accent. I'm telling you, it's the Southwest Virginia. Okay. <laughs> it's what it is. I'm saying Harold, Howard, but it's it's that Appalachian slang is what it is. So. Any, oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, you're not the first person. They're like, what are you saying? Yeah, can't help it. It's pretty deep in the roots here. So, But, Harry, tell us a little bit about, about you, what you do, and then we're going to get into some dogs and talk hounds. Okay. Um, I I run coyote hounds. I hunt on the outside. Though, and I guess you'll learn more about what I mean by outside as the podcast goes along. But, um I hunt dogs. Uh, a lot of people nowadays run in pens and, and do what I call, they run dogs. Um, I, I'm actually hunting coyotes and, uh, we try to, we, we, well, we don't shoot the coyotes. We run to catch. And, uh, so that's what I do. It's, it's my love. Um, when turkey or deer season comes in, uh, our conservation department doesn't allow us to, hunt on the outside of pens so we'll go to a pen we'll run in there uh for exercise and and you can get a closer look at your hound because he's he's cooped inside this fence uh whether it be a hundred acres or or a thousand acres uh they're going to come back by you where on the outside a coyote may never return and you just have to stay close to your truck or stay in your truck and travel along with them and so uh when you go to a pen you you get a lot uh, more looks at your dogs on crossings and stuff like that. Right. So um, I, I guess I, I guess that go ahead. Nope. No, I was just gonna I was just gonna go back and um kind of tell how you got into hounds and I know that your grandfather had a big part in this. So what what got you started into the hound world to begin with? Well I don't remember the first time I went with my grandpa. He took me from the time I was little. Um, I know we went to a field trial when I was five, and I, he gave me the trophy that the dog won. And, and you know, I was hooked. Um, the dog that we won with, I had actually um, been hunting with my grandpa. Um, I'd say it, it may have been a year or two after this field trial, actually, but... Um, we had a beagle, a beagle club and they, they ran rabbits and coyotes were killing their rabbits and they wanted us to come in and help them kill the coyotes. So we took our hounds over there and all the beagle club guys had shotguns and we turned the dogs loose and they jumped a coyote and I wandered off from my grandpa. I, he didn't care. He, he let me hunt, you know, and, and I, I walked in probably a half a mile from where the truck was and I heard a shot. And I looked up across this cornfield where the corn had been picked and a coyote come out across that, that field and those dogs were after it. And uh, that guy had hit that coyote and I actually got to see those dogs close the gap and, and tackle this coyote. And they just roll, they all rolled. And I think I may have been hooked already, but if I wasn't <laughs> that for sure hooked me. And um, so I walked across the field and uh, I remember that old man, he, he gave me a dollar if I wanted to drag that coyote back to the truck. Well, I didn't know if I could, but I'd have done it for free or I maybe paid him. But <laughs> he gave me a dollar and I drug that thing and it about killed me, but I got it back to the truck. And uh, that was just the first memory that I probably had of coyote hunting. And uh, it, it was a good deal. Well, my, my grandpa, one night we were out hunting and we had a coon hunting friend 
who went with us, and he asked my grandpa if I if he knew of anybody that had coon dog or that wanted coon dog puppies. And I sat there, and I, I knew I wasn't supposed to be getting in their conversation, but man, I wanted to speak up bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just sat there and thought about that coon dog puppy till later on when I got a chance, and I asked my grandpa if I could have one of the puppies, and he said, you're going to have to ask your mom and dad, so I couldn't wait to get home. Well, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning when we got home, and so the next day I was asking, and they said, yeah, I got a coon dog puppy, and i become a coon hunter until the time that my grandpa died when I was 21. And uh, at that point, I didn't want to let his pack of hounds get away. And uh, so I bought them for my grandmother. And I couldn't hunt both packs like I thought dogs needed to be hunted. So I ended up selling out of the coon dogs. And now that that's pretty much the rest is history. I'm, I'm a coyote hunter now. Right. What kind of, what? and I know you told me this already, but what, what kind of dogs were you coon hunting? I mean, if you hunted them for, that was a good 15, 15 years or so, right? Yeah, um, I had uh, Walker dog, Korean Walkers. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one, actually, this coon hunter, and it's just kind of ironic that it was this way. He had a jip that was a running walker that a uh, guy that I got to know later, he had her, and she went to Tree and Coons, and she was no good as a foxhound. And he had her, and she was an excellent coon dog. And he bred her to a tree and walker. And um, I think it was a, some Finley River stuff, if I'm not mistaken, on the top side. Mm-hmm. And um, so I went with this half running dog and half tree and walker. But the running dog part was a great tree dog. And um, I got me a pup that was a great running dog, but not a good tree dog. He he would run to the tree. And I was, I was nine years old when I started hunting. And hunted by myself and uh i remember he would run and he'd shut up and i'd shine the trees and try to find the coon and then i'd take him over there and i'd pat the tree and pet him and everything and uh, long story short he never worked out but i moved on i i ended up buying me a black and tan that was a great dog but he was silent on track and i treated a lot of coons and at that time coons were probably well they were forty dollars maybe for a good Mm -hmm. one and it didn't take me long to pay back the $300 that it cost to get that dog. And uh, having a good dog, I ended up having buddies starting to hunt with me then. So I didn't have to be out in the woods alone, you know. And uh, it didn't bother me to be out in the woods. I was never scared. But later in life, I had kids. And I can't imagine. My my, my mom and dad let me hunt. Uh, they didn't know what I was doing. I was climbing trees and shaking coons out. I was crossing creeks or rivers that I should not have been crossing as a nine-year-old kid, but I learned a lot. I lived through it and it's made me a better hunter, I think. (laughs) Right. So back to the, well, I guess we, this can get into the, some of the other, so you said the running dog that you bred to actually would tree. Yes. Yeah. So for, is that That typical? That was what? That was her down. That was her downfall oh. as far as the running dog oh. guy was concerned. She, that's all she would do is fall off and tree the first coon that she came across. When she was running coyotes? Or what was she? What yeah, was it? she was supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, well. Hmm. So she had too much tree in her, huh? Yeah, I, that's I, right. I guess, you know, for me, I, looking at that, I, you know, I've never thought about it. I never thought, well, that tree was a bad thing. But I guess in the running world, that's not something that is looked up you know is it, it's frowned upon yeah and we can go a whole i tell you i could probably spend another hour talking on that because it's a, an issue i have trouble with the gamier hounds that i have um i have trouble keeping them off of coons um in other words a lot of time when i go hunting at nighttime i'll howl and get a cow to answer me and I'll either drive or send the dogs to this coyote. And uh, the reason is, if I just send them into a cornfield in the bottom, you know, where there's a lot of water and stuff, mm-hmm. they'll hit a coon a lot of times. And, and them coons will put up a race. They don't go to a tree like they do for a running dog. I don't know if it's the, if it's the difference in speed or what, but um, we'll have a 30-minute race in a cornfield a lot of times, and it end up being a coon. And, and that's not what we're after. And uh, you can't really... It's hard to use a, sh- a training collar 
and train them off of it because by the time you figure out what it was, it's on the ground and they're fighting it, you know? And mm-hmm. so it's, it's a whole new issue, but I've got my line of dogs. Uh, I've had them tree coons. I mean, they put their feet up on a tree and look like a night champion, you know, and mm-hmm. I'm aggravated when I get there. And I know most coon hunters wouldn't understand that, but <clears throat> it's an aggravation. So what line of dogs are you? So let's go back to your, let's backtrack to your granddad. You said that, your granddad passed away when you were 21 and that you decided that you were going to let the coon dogs go because you wanted to keep his line going. Is that still a line that you have today? Yes. Yes. So yes, I've, I've started there and I've just uh, kept breeding on and, and that's, uh, it's, it's a part of me that, uh, that I won't let go now, you know, mm-hmm. what kind of, what, so what, what dog, what kind of, what line is that? Is that the line that y'all have developed or, is that a line that you've just carried on from from others, or how how does that work? Tell to explain that to me. Um, yeah, I'll go I'll go kind of back in my grandpa's history just a little bit. Uh, he had a line uh, of Walker dogs that was uh, Glover's Powerhouse. He was a real famous stud dog, um, and the Glover's Powerhouse dogs were the ones that I watched catch the coyote. Well, my grandpa somewhere in there he he got out of dogs because of his job for just a little while, and when he got back in. He got connected up with a guy that had July hounds, and mm-hmm. he bought these Julys, and uh, they were off of a, a real famous July stud dog, and he took and, and he bred them on, and uh, when he got them, he was just amazed at how fast they could run. They would uh, clear a barbed wire fence, or a uh, woven wire fence with barbed wire on top, and gain so much ground on his hunting buddies' dogs that he was just tickled to death that he was able to buy something like that. So um, when I got his dogs, I uh, took them to a field trial, and I didn't know anything about it. I'd always kind of let him do the conditioning and and all that. So we went to a field trial, and uh, my wife was actually my girlfriend at the time, and uh, I knew where there was a really good stud dog that I wanted to breed my dogs to. Well, I had a guy come up to me and ask, if I would sell him this puppy I had, and I didn't really want to sell it, but he had a litter mate to that stud dog. And I said, I would trade you for him. And I was just joking because I didn't think there was any chance. He said, well, I'd trade you, but I'd have to have a hundred dollars difference. Well, at the time I didn't have a hundred (laughs) dollars, but my girlfriend did. And so she gave me the hundred dollars. She said, we're partners on these dogs. And I said, the worst part about that is we can't break up now if I like this dog. And so, (laughs) um, her name was Quigley. My name's last name was Owen. And so we used the O Q and that's my kennel name. Uh, every dog I've got is uh, named like say uh, I had one named Reuben. His name was OQ's Rock and Red Reuben. And uh, with the kennel name is stuck. We've been married 34 years. And uh, so it's uh, just, it's been a long story that, you know, branches out and we can go a lot of different ways from here with the, the way it's going, you know. Mm-hmm. So I want to learn more about, so you're running, basically running a J- J- July cross back dog. Well, actually, uh, when he got back in, he got into July's. Mm-hmm. The July's did have a tad bit of Walker in them, but he liked the July's so well, he stayed straight July, and I have too since that time. So uh, my dogs may have a one 128 walker in them mm-hmm. but the, the glover's powerhouse dogs when he got out he sold those dogs mm-hmm. so uh it's pretty much straight july now you know so what puts a curiosity what puts the tree in those dogs is it just because they're so gamey that they don't they don't care wherever it goes they're gonna they're gonna park it there or is there something that goes back that's causing that that tree to show up i think it's the gaminess um I've tried different breeds and some of them don't do that. Mm -hmm. Some of them, oh, I had some puppies here one time. I let them run loose and kind of break themselves. And I had a fox around here. Um, There was somebody shot the fox or whatever. And I didn't have anything except rabbits and squirrels. And they got the tree and squirrels for me. And and they were just gamey hounds. And it was just that that particular line. And so I, I, I really think it's just the gaminess. And the more tracky a hound is, the more likely he's going to treat. If you, in, in coyote, 
hunting, you can have a dog. I call him a heads up dog. Um, they run hard. They don't put their nose to the ground. They just wind it. And those kind of dogs don't treat much because they, they pass the tree looking for the scent, you know, at such a speed. And, and they may come back and look around. But they're not likely to treat like a tracking <clears throat> hound is. Mm-hmm. So, and if you have the dogs that do park, get parked, how do you do you break do you ever break them from that or is that just something like you said you you cater your hunting to make sure that you give them less opportunities to do that that's how i do it yeah um you know i'm not gonna go in the tree and pet them right um I, I, you know i, I was kind of maybe scold them or whatever verbally i don't whip them either i just uh i get them off of it and i go try to put them in a, a good opportunity to jump a coyote mm-hmm yeah. So, yeah, and that's one thing a lot of people don't understand when it comes to training. Um, and, you know, I hear this a lot with possums and coon hunters. You know, my dog trained a possum. You know, they scold the dog. They they use E on it. They do every – and I've done it too. I've done everything under the sun. But they have – you got to understand that negative attention is still attention. And it's like it's like the kid that, that knows he's going to get in trouble, but he does it anyway because his parents aren't giving him the attention that he needs – um, and then it's like Dennis the Menace, you know, that's, that's kind of what happens with the dog. And, you know, I think what you're doing, um, without even knowing your world that, you know, you just go put them on a lead, you don't speak to them, you go do the next thing. And then eventually that goes, well, I'm not getting paid for this. So this is not worth my time. Right. Yeah. Right. right. And, and, and I've had some luck. Um, last year I had dogs jump a coon. And I had cornfields on both sides of the road. And a coon, um, it, coons and coyotes, we love hunting in cornfields because they'll get in those rows and, and give you a real race. Mm -hmm. Well, the coon crossed the road right behind my truck, and one of my dogs happened to catch it as it as it crossed the road. And I jumped out. I, I, I Before I even got completely out of the truck, I heard the coon squall. I get right back in the truck, and I push the button, and I lit that dog up. He thought the coon was what did, did that. Mm -hmm. Now, the rest of my dogs – Still will bump a coon, but that dog here, he won't he won't mess with a coon anymore. So he had a he negative did. experience, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> you done some you done some elimination training. But but he had it in his mouth. Like that's what people don't understand is you you took that opportunity when the dog actually had a hold of the game you do not want him. And and when you're not involved and that that, that stimulation comes in the dog pairs that with the ant. It's just like dogs fighting. You shock a dog for fighting, well, they think the other dog's doing it. So, you know, a lot of times that causes worse problems. But, no, yeah. So, just talk to me about your hunting. Like, you say you hunt on the outside. Kind of feel like I'm in jail. We on the outside now <laughs> instead of the prison in the confine. But, so, let, let's yeah. let's talk about outside, and then let's talk about – I want to know some about your competition on the inside of that, too. So, Let's talk about the outside. How, what, what style of dog are you looking for? Like, what is your? If you could pick out a dog, what is something that you're looking for for your for your own benefit? Well, um, I guess the way I'd start that is I'll talk about what I have now. Um, I made a cross, and they were heads up, swingy type dogs. Uh, the daddy was that way, but the daddy learned. You know, after about he was two years old, I think, when I started noticing him closing in. When they, when they, let's say the game turns ninety degrees, they keep going straight. Well, he would go straight for a half a mile, and if there was a highway there, he'd hit the highway and keep going. I mean, he was an aggravation. But as a two-year-old, he he started closing in on those loses and tightening up, and he became a, a dog that he was smart enough to know when to tighten up and he was smart enough to know when to swing. And that made him a, a really good coyote dog. He could gain ground by swinging mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe not running a uh, hundred yards of that track and still going full blast. And when he got to the track where the coyote, where he picked the coyote back up, uh, he, he was closer than he was when he lost it. But then he also didn't go two miles in the wrong direction sometimes. And um, so I bred him while well, his, pups they were too swingy um i had uh, six of them 
and uh, five of them were really swingy and, and one of them wasn't. And I ended up, I've only got one left because you can't have a whole litter of pups that go the wrong direction on a lose. You, it's hard to train them. It's, mm -hmm. I, to be honest, to answer your question, I like a tracky dog. But a swingy dog or two in the pack doesn't hurt a thing because, like I say, they may gain ground on the coyote <coughs> where the rest of them lose and hunt it and then hit that track and, and, and <coughs> get it going again. The swingy dogs maybe gained 100 yards on the coyote. And then I want those tracking dogs to be the kind that listen and pull up to the bark, and I don't want them to just run that track behind all night, which that's another issue that you can run into with a tracky dog is, is they want to run every bit of that track and, and they'll be behind the rest of the race. But right now uh, I'm hunting at night. I hunt, hunt at night. Usually, uh, Oh, April is when I start hunting at night. The days are, are they start getting hotter. Um, and, and I like the cornfields cornfields right now. They're getting about thigh high, which is about right for those, those cows will get in those rows. And you may be able to sit in one place in your truck all night and listen to this race. And by talking about this race, sometimes we'll catch four or five coyotes in a night. And so you could sit there in one spot, listen to this race. Uh, they bay it. You, I'll walk in. Walking in through a cornfield uh, through 200 rows sideways is not fun at nighttime when there's dew on the corn. But it's just something I do. We'll go into the catch the coyotes not worth anything, but I've got sheep and I'm trying to kill coyotes and, and, and it's good for me. And, and all the farmers uh, give me permission because they want the coyotes killed. And um, so that's the way I hunt at night in the winter time, um, stay at the truck and, and all the crops are out. We have uh, probably, I'd say 60% open ground and 40% woods. And so the coyotes will go from the woods uh, through the open ground and uh in the truck you get to see a lot of it and it's exciting especially you know if you get to see a pack close in and catch a coyote or whatever uh it, it'll get your your blood pumping get your adrenaline flowing and uh so daytime nighttime th those are two different things then in turkey and deer season uh with with it not being legal i'll go to a, a, a pen we call them fox pens because the first ones were stocked with foxes now almost all of them are stocked with coyotes foxes go in uh go in a den or whatever uh if they're run too much in the pens in the pens uh they get run enough that they get used to going in to a den and and you may you might get a 30 minute race and that's it coyotes will stay out and run so um we go to a pen uh we'll run that's for training purposes conditioning purposes and also um for I guess you call it culling purposes. You can see a lot of crossings. You can see what dog's doing, what you get a lot of opportunities to see your dogs in action. And so uh, you can really uh, cull a dog a lot faster in a pen. And uh, he could become a hero in your eyes in a pen a lot quicker too, you know, if he's doing the right thing all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the three, three aspects to what I do other than field trialing. And then that's a whole new game. Yeah, so you, when you was talking about your dog being swingy, like one of my male dogs, Spook, he cuts and slashes. That's kind of what I call it. And when he gets up tight on a bear, then that's he don't do that anymore. And it's kind of it's kind of interesting to watch exactly what you're saying. Um, you know how he makes up ground and how he gets out front is because of what you're explaining is he's able to shortcut the track a lot of times. Um, and he, he, he will swing on a tree if he overruns it. And I've got another dog that she's a little bit slower than he is, and she'll pick that tree up. And he, you'll see him on the Garmin kind of make that, he'll go past it, make that circle, and then he'll come right back into it. So what you're explaining to me, I can visually see with some of my dogs. And what they're doing, you know, just in a different, different, different game. And when you talk about track, like, so, and I, I get different opinions on this because I've asked several people, like, with your running dogs, like, what kind of nose are you getting? Like, are you wanting your dogs to 
to pretty much trail up a coyote, jump him, and get him going, or are you wanting to put him on a, um, a a track that's already up and moving? What what is your style, and what what do the dogs do? I want them to trail it up and jump it. I, on the outside, I think it's critical. Um, nowadays, there's so many places where you can't run hounds anymore. A lot of the people in different states are hunting in pens, and you don't need a trailing dog in a pen. There's there's stocked with a lot of game. Dogs that can run around the road and hit a, hit a coyote, and, and, and they start their track there. But for what I do, I need a dog to still hunt, trail, um I, I just like it too it's the way i started you know and mm-hmm. um at nighttime we'll howl and get the coyote to answer and the dogs will go in a lot of times there's no hunting or trailing you may hear a little bit of a uh baying or, or a yeah 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 you know and then the coyote's off and running so there's no trailing there no hunting but um some nights you can't get them to answer some nights it's uh windy and you can't hear them very far and, and you send dogs in and they got a bit of hunt and trail and talking about nose, I, I think a nose is the biggest thing I look for, you know, the, the number one item I'm looking for because um, when I when I go hunting, people talk about, uh, with running dogs, people, they're always talking about speed. And a lot of people think speed is athleticism, um, how fast a dog can physically run. And I think a dog with a good nose uh, will outscore a uh, athletic dog every time because it, it, the way the field trials work the, the judges is scoring the front dog and it's getting more points than the second dog and the second's getting more than the third dog and uh if that front dog's the one smelling it he's 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 gonna stay the front because the athletic dogs may pass him but they may not be on the track so uh nose is to me is really important and um my best dogs i've ever had had an extremely good nose so what about um and this is something that I've I've run into with with mine is you know I've talked to different people owners of the same bloodline that I have um and I get a mixed review but my my two best dogs are tight on the ground and I think a lot of people and I've said it on here before a lot of people think that they're cold they're hot nosed because they're not opening and I have seen over the last two years, my dogs are four now. I have seen over the last two years that they'll get off and they'll start working an area. Um, like just they'll, they'll start working a hollow and they'll go down that, that, that hollow and they'll just keep, you know, you'll see them making circles and zigzagging. And, you know, you can tell if a dog's working or he's just piddling, you know, just going, you know, straight down it and just taking off. But you can see them working an area and, you know, next thing you know, they're a half a mile in there and they're jumped. And of course, then they're, they're called or treed pretty quick because they're tight. Um, is that something you see a lot of in the running dogs or is that not what you guys look for? Well, I've, I've seen uh, extremes on both ends. Um, I've seen dogs put their nose to the ground. You could tell when they're smelling the track, you know, just by body language and not bark. Some of them aren't as free of barkers as others for one one but uh i've watched them and they don't bark till they get up and get the track fairly hot and then they start opening um then i've seen dogs that maybe are right beside that dog that can't even smell it you know you can tell by what he's doing he he's he's not wagging his tail he's not sniffing the ground he's not getting excited he's just drifting along with the dog and um then you've got some that uh, are real free barkers and I don't like them if they're, too, you know, mm-hmm. almost babblers. Uh, an old man told me once time he had a dog that had a cold nose and a loose tongue, you know, and you just see that dog barking all over the place. I, I'd like for them to get a mediocre track going before they start open because I don't want them to be letting the coyote know they're coming. I, mm-hmm. I want them to get up on him where we can have a race and, and maybe catch him, you know. And I hear a lot of the, um, a lot of the cat dog guys, too, um, they look so the, the the couple that I've talked to. They like a dog to be a little bit tighter. They want that. They want him to get up on that cat before he starts opening. So, I guess it's just difference in the the game that we're chasing and um, for us. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and I I don't know anything about mountain lions, but uh, bobcats we do run them occasionally, and 
my better dogs, and when I say my better dogs, the ones that I think back and they stand out in my mind, that was the cold nose dogs, and those dogs would run a bobcat occasionally. And um, I've caught bobcats on the ground, you know, and it's it's an exciting thing. I don't I don't personally look at it, at that as trash. I know some guys would, but I, I have so much fun doing it. I, I if I see a bobcat, a lot of times I'll get my cold nose dog out and put it on him just to see if we can have a race. It seems like they're, you know, you have to have a cold nose dog around here to run a bobcat. I don't know if it's that way everywhere, but uh, yeah, cat dog. I could I could see you really wouldn't want them to bark until they had that track pretty warmed up, and and a, a silent trailing dog probably would actually help you get a bobcat race going a lot easier than than the dog that barked a lot. Yeah, yeah. So let's go inside. Let's go inside the cell block. When you're when you guys are doing the competition, and I heard you know you just talked about you know the dog up front gets scored, but being a judge in several other areas of hounds, like that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best dog. So how does the scoring go? How do how do these things work? And when you say a pen, what what acreage are we looking at? I know that a lot of the guys down here <coughs> in North Carolina. Um, they're looking, they're, most of them's got about a 50, 20 to 50 acre block is what they're looking at. The journey on Houndsman XP has teamed up with one TDC. This dual action support for oral health and mobility in our dogs. This unique supplement is so effective that it is recommended by top veterinarian experts worldwide to maintain and improve our dog's health in four different areas. Their oral health, hips, joints, and muscles, skin, coat, energy, and recovery. Guys, I've been using this product for the last six months, and it has been a game changer for me. If you're looking for something to help with the overall health of your dog, go to WorkSoWell.com and give this product a try. It is highly recommended by Houndsman XP here on The Journey. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying the journey on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network with Heath Hyatt. He's always putting together a lot of good information for us. This is Chris Powell with the Houndsman XP Podcast, and I want to give you some good information right now. I want to talk to you about Onyx. Onyx Maps. I integrate Onyx with my Garmin system. I travel all over the United States hunt everywhere. And if I was to buy a mapping card for every place I hunt, it would be very costly. You can go to onxmaps.com and get a subscription for their elite package for $99. And you will have maps anywhere in the United States that you are hunting. Super easy. All you got to do is look at your Garmin, see where you're at. The Onyx app on your, on your phone will also show you where you're at. You can do all your orientation right there side by side. Go to onxmaps.com and at checkout, enter the promo code HXP20 and you will get 20% off of your subscription. It's that easy, folks. Check out Onyx at onxmaps.com. You can find their link on our website at houndsmanxp.com. Know where you stand with Onyx. Um, for a person, for a guy to have his own personal pen, um, 40 acres is the least that's even legal in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And, um, you can't run very many. In other words, okay, I guess I got to set it up this way. A guy who owns a pen has to buy the game for that pen. So if you buy coyotes for that pen and it's a 40 acre pen and five dogs in that pen are going to cause every coyote to be caught then that guy's not going to stay in business long. It's not what he wants. He wants to use that pen. So it depends on how much brush is in there, how much open. And in other words, how many times the coyotes, uh, the dogs could see the coyote and close the gap by eyesight. Mm -hmm. um, so every pen is different. A real thick pen, you can have less acreage than a, a, a big pen. Um, now, if you're going to competition hunt, about the – smallest successful pen uh, that I've ever been to is probably four or 500 acres. Normally um, it's 600 to 
1,200 acres, I would say, is the average pen that we go to that's uh, uh, used for competition. And I've been in pens that are 2,000 acres. And uh, the one pen, I remember, uh, it was in Georgia. Um, it was uh, 75 miles of road inside this pen and 10 miles around the fence. And it was, uh, I think it was 1,800 and some acres. Wow. And so we're talking, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big expense. But the difference in coyote field trialing or foxhound field trialing and coonhound field trialing or, or beagles or a lot of different things. Um, a lot of times when I was coon hunting, it was four dog cast or almost always you'd have four dog cast. And in foxhounds, all the dogs get turned loose at the same time. So if you have 150 dogs uh, at this pen in Georgia and you turn 150 dogs loose in there, um, it's plenty big to handle the pressure that there, it's big enough that you're going to have a lot of different packs running, you know, maybe a one dog pack or maybe a 20 dog pack running on a coyote. Judges are scattered out within this pen uh, on crossings and, and the local guys know where to go, you know, and they'll set up uh, in their area of the pen and they'll judge dogs as they come through. Now the rules have kind of changed um, over the years. Um, Field trialing used to happen on outside only, and that's the way the rules were written. And now field trials are mostly, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent in pins. And so the rules had to be changed because there's a lot of game in pins. It's it's not a deal where they're ha having to hunt or trail as much as they do on the outside. So uh, it, it's uh, it's a deal where we do have a class where you score for hunting and you have a class where you score for trailing. And then we have the speed and drive class, but a lot of, a lot of field trials are set up just for speed and drive. And a lot of hunters are anti hunting and trailing. Most of those guys are pin guys only because a lot of them never have experienced the need to have to hunt and trail. So this thing has evolved over time and changed a lot, you know, it seems like to me as a hunter, like you have to have the hunt, you have to have the, tr or you should have the trail, and then the speed should come at the end of it. To me, that's what you're looking for for a well-rounded dog. Yeah, for, for a hunter, that's true. For a runner, like I said before, a lot of these guys are just runners now. They go to a pen in their own personal time, they turn dogs loose. There's coyotes. There, there might be coyotes. Uh, if you watch them feed the coyotes, uh, there might be 20 coyotes up there eating. They pull in the gate. They open their dog box. Dogs hit the ground, and they just are on a hot trail, and they run. And they run until the guys catch them or the dogs wear out. Mm -hmm. And um, the coyotes uh, in, in the pen seems like they work together and switch enough that uh, – they don't get caught. And, and, and that's actually a big key. That's, a, that's something that we try for in pins because we don't want to catch the man's game, even though the rest of the year for me, uh, it's all about catching the game. Mm -hmm. And so I go in there and, and I just, I don't do anything different to my dog. I just go in there and I hope, I hope that they don't catch his game. And if they do bay it, a lot of times a coyote will get behind the electric wire, uh, which We'll keep the dogs back, and, and I'll go in, I'll get the dogs and, and get them off of him. Or sometimes we'll get a hold of the coyote and put him in a safe spot and turn him loose again and, and run a different coyote. But it's a complete different game, and it's not really hunting. It's running. Mm -hmm. And um, so, like you say, in a hunter's mind, hunting and trailing and then speed and drive would be what you're after. But uh, a lot of guys are hound runners now. So let's go through the point system. So talk, let's let's talk about hunting first. How do you judge that, and how do you okay. critique it? Okay, as a judge, uh, you're out there in the woods. You see a dog coming through, and then you, you see him wagging his tail up there, and he's sniffing around. You can tell he's he's looking for something. Each individual judge uh, has has uh, his his discretion can give that dog. Within the first hour, you can give him 10 points, and then the point system goes up as, as the hours go along. So a dog in the fifth hour comes along and hunting, you can give him 20, I think it's 25 points, I believe, uh, because 
it, it's harder for a dog to hunt if he's tired. So mm-hmm. you give him more points if he's doing a good job, or if you think he's really he's hunting, but he's not doing that good. You can give him ten in the fifth hour too. It's 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 all a judgment call on the hunting class mm-hmm. and uh, actually on the trailing class too. But why was it like if if we're hunting in a in a pen, would it take five hours to find a coat? No, not not unless you you happen to go to a pen that didn't have any game right. or something like that. So when I'm talking about these rules, they were set up on the outside, and this is the same set of rules that was taken to a pin. Nowadays, a lot of guys don't even have the hunting and trailing rules in these pins that have so much game in them. They, they, they've taken them out. And you've got old-timers or, or guys who are set in their ways, grew up the old style. Um, they get aggravated at the young guys for not – wanting hunting you know it's just mm-hmm. like anything else you got guys that have different opinions um there's been you know splits within the hunting organizations over just guys uh liking one set of rules versus another set of rules and the thing is everybody hunts differently and i've done it all and i like it all i i, I can see both sides of the coin you know mm-hmm. yeah i and i can i could see the the issue with just the the need for speed. I get that. I mean, I completely get it. Um, all right. So you get, so that's how you judge the hunting part. Now let's talk about the tracking or the trailing part. Okay. So a dog, you hear a dog trailing and I I ride a horse as much as I can when I judge it because I can get around quicker. So I'll head towards this dog and, uh, and these dogs all have numbers on them that we, we judge them by the number on their side. That's how we know a difference. And so we paint numbers on them or um, like I like white dogs and uh, I use black hair dye. And so you get in here, you see the dog trailing. Um, you you decide as a judge, uh, once again, 10 points is the minimum. 30 points is the maximum. 30 points can be given if that dog jumps the game and runs it. If you actually, you know, get an opportunity to see the dog jump the game and run it, you can give him 30 points. So you decide what you're going to give this dog and you write that number down and the amount of points and then the time. And then that way, if another judge scores him, he can only be allowed so many hunting or so many trailing points per hour. That way he's not just loaded up on hunting and trailing points. Um, and it gets kind of complicated if you get into the uh, figuring the winner because the way the rules were set up, it's a it's called highest general average. So they average the hunting category, the trailing category, and the speed and drive category. And then all the total points there, there's actually an endurance category. And in the endurance category, the judge doesn't doesn't figure that or score that. It's totally figured off the average of these other three categories. And then all four categories are averaged together and the highest score wins. And, and we could go there if you want, but that's going to be another hour or two to talk about how that works. No, but I want to go back. If if you're judging a dog on trailing and you, and you, you say there's 150 dogs, let's just say there's 20 dogs in this cast, or, or is that what you call them? There's a there's twenty. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you don't. We never have that few. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe a um, hundred dogs is a little bit more than the minimum. And and so let's say there's a hundred dogs. Okay, so there's a hundred dogs, and you're going to judge these dogs on trailing. How do you pick apart who's doing what? What? Like, how do you say, okay, this dog's going to get maximum points, but the fourth dog in line, is it barking because the front dog's barking or is it barking because it's actually trail? Like, you know, you start seeing these things, you're like, mm-mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> you hit on something that that uh, there's a fine line between trailing and speed and drive. And it's it's kind of a judgment call. When you have four dogs barking on a trail, it, it's – I would say 99% of the time it's, it's speed and drive. Uh, when, what I consider trailing, uh, usually you might have a, a couple dogs doing it. You might have a hundred dogs out there, but they're not all together. They're, they're all in the woods, but here working this trail, usually 
you might have five or six dogs uh, on a on a mediocre warm trail, and one or two will be doing the barking. And um, so those two are the ones that you try to score. And you try to well, you you score any that are trailing, but that's just the way it is. It's normally, not more than one or two trailing scores are given at the time, in my experience. You know. And, a, and so this is just coming to a thought. Would you benefit by having an independent dog that goes and gets their own game versus the dog that is in a pack? Okay, yeah, that's that's where coon hunting is different. You know, like independence is a big deal in the coon hunting world. Mm-hmm. In the foxhound world, uh, yeah, he might get a trailing score and he might get hunt, hunting score because he was alone doing it by himself. But by the time he jumps it... Um, and like I said, there's been a split in the rules, but national rules and some of the other rules are the same. Once he jumps that game, if he's running by himself, a running a lone score is 20 points. A running up front, a first place score is 35 points. So he may have benefited in the mm-hmm. hunting and the trailing. He gets it jumped and really uh, most of the day he ought to be running. The hunting and trailing should be at the beginning or on a lose possibly. And so, uh, for the for the biggest part of the day, he should be getting speed and drive scores, and he's getting twenty every time. Now, when he's barking, he's pulling more dogs to him too, so mm-hmm. it could work in his favor if he's fast enough to hold the front end. But uh, I, nobody really wants him to be independent that I know of, uh, like in the coon dog world. Mm-hmm. And for me, hunting, I don't want him to be independent because I like a pack. I, I like to hunt a pack. Mm-hmm. Now, I like every single dog to be able to do his own work. Don't get me wrong, but I don't want him to leave pressure. And I've and I've called for that before. A dog that he just can't quite run up, or it's too much work for him, so he goes off and gets his own game. I don't I don't like a dog like that. And then the field trials, other than what you said, maybe getting more trailing points or something mm-hmm. like that, he would not benefit. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about <coughs> running, like. What is your expectation for when your dog gets in, let's say he's jumped. Let's just get to that point. You've jumped and they're, they're running the yoke. How long do you expect that dog to stay with it? Like what is like for me and I don't have all my, I don't have my, all my dogs are not like this, but this is what I want. I want to have to go pull that dog off that animal. Like, I want to have to go catch them off. That is my expectation, but I don't have a pack of those at this point in time. What is yours? Um, okay, and I, I I know this is a podcast, and this is a, a good thing to be windy, but, I, I mean, I can go on and on about this. It's changed over time. When I was a kid, um, if a dog was barking, you wanted your dog out there with it. And if it came in, hunters used to call them for for quitting, quitting was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And then I'd say in the, uh, around 1990, somewhere in that area, uh, Harlan Stone Cypher was a, a, a guy from, uh, Oklahoma, um, had a lot of money and, and influence in every, I guess, aspect of life. But in the hound world, he started having field trials that were three hours. Nobody had ever heard of that. And man, he got slammed by the old timers that wanted a dog to run eight to, 14, 15, 16 hours, you know, mm-hmm. the guys used to go out at dark and they wanted their dogs to be running at daylight. And, um, so then he has these three hour hunts and people say you're breeding the toughness out of them and everything. Um, in a way it has in a way really nowadays, there's very few guys that want a tough hound. They want speed and speed only, and they'll sacrifice you know, that dog could quit in two and a half hours if he scored enough points to win. They like him. Uh, I'm still old school. If, if a dog, I, I really, if a dog's still barking, I want mine out there. Um, not saying that's what I have, but my dogs will run um, eight hours for sure, you know, and uh, I'm talking about going to a pen, and that's where I really try. In the, in the cornfields, we normally, well, we'll catch a coyote before like three to four hours would be a long race. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in a fox pen where they're trading off, the coyotes are trading off and the dogs are running. Um, yeah, I want my dog to be out there eight hours. And, and nowadays with the GPS and everything, I'm ready to go home anyway. So I, I catch him up and I got them where they handle and 
Um, in my case, I blow a whistle, turn the lights on those collars. I start seeing lights. I'll shine my light. I'll turn my headlight on and shine it towards them, and they come toward me. And that's from hunting them on the outside. I to leave certain situations like highways or whatever. I've just got them broke to handle the best. And um, so at eight hours in a pen, uh, I go to blowing that whistle and we go home. So uh, I don't want anything blowing the whistle at me. <laughs> I don't want them to tell me when we're going. Right. Home. I want to be the one to call, you know. Right. And so uh, I hold it against him really hard if he, if he quits before I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, my, my great granddad, um, he used to run Fox. I mean, back in the, huh, that was back in the, Early 80s is back as far as I can remember um, when he was doing it. And that's what they did. They'd go out at dark, and they catch the dogs up after daylight, and that's what they expected. Um, I have very little knowledge about it other than listening to him talk. But, um, you know, I, that, and that's how I want my dogs. Uh, if, they're, if they're on a walking bear, like, don't come off until I get you. That's just it. Don't come off. Like you better stay. And and again, again, I do. I don't have a pack of that. I've got a couple, um, <clears throat> but I and I don't have that as a whole. And I I want my dogs to stay after. I'm like you. Like, e- well, even if another dog's not barking, I want mine in there barking. Like, if you've got it up and running, you better do your job. Just do your job, and I'll do my part. I'm a little older and slower. It may take me a few more minutes, but but I'm going. I'll get to you. Just give me a minute. But I want you to stay there till I do. Right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, and anymore in, uh, I would say probably in the foxhound world, maybe seventy percent really don't care anything about how tough they are. Or if they come in, that's fine. As long as they did a good job when they're out there. But, so uh, what we. Really, we got to finish up with the speed. Like, okay, so you just could kind of hit on it. So basically, as long as you're, when you're crossing the paths or the, the crossing points, as long as you're up front, you're getting those points. Yes. Yeah. Uh, speed and drive is what it's all about in the modern era, I guess you'd say nowadays. Um, we run for trucks, you know, uh, and it's all judged on the front dog gets 35 and the second dog gets 30. And it drops back five point increments, and there's different sets of rules how far you go back with that. Uh, uh, seven dogs is where one one of the rules they they go back to five points, and uh, there's judges strategically put all over the pen. Um, you turn loose at a certain time, and the, the hunts are a lot, a lot of the speed and drive hunts nowadays are three hours. Uh, some are still four or five, and uh, at the end of that time. The hunters come in, they start catching dogs. The judges go turn their scores in, and everything's there's computer programs now where they turn their uh, scores into a computer programmer. Um, they add them up, and, and the, the most simple uh, set of rules is where they just add them together, and the dog with the most points wins. Um, there, and there's a lot of different sets of rules that come in there. Probably the, one of the main uh, things that I think differentiates it is um, most or a lot of hunts you have to write the time of that score down. So if that dog goes to the woods and hits another judge in a hundred yards and he's scored him two, that way a dog's not gathering a lot of points uh, because of hitting strategic judges. Uh, he's got to score once every five minutes and everything else is thrown out and they keep his maximum score for that five minutes. So there, you get into a lot of details with this and, and a lot of different sets of rules. But in general, the dog that crossed the road um, the most times up front, uh, you know, he's going to have the most score and he's the winner. That's that's really the – it's a simple deal and it's probably the most popular deal nowadays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, I guess, you know, for the competition side of it, I guess that's what you need. And But for the – for the the hunting side of it, that's just a part of it. It's not it's not the whole makeup. So, right, well, right. yep. b- before we wrap this up, just take a few minutes here and, and and tell us what you would like us to know about the running dog world. Um, like what what is important 
what makes you, you know, I know that anybody that likes a dog and catching game, that, that's what kind of what makes them tick. But what is it that you want us that, that don't have a lot of experience or do, don't know a lot about it? What is, what is it, some things, advice, some stuff that you would tell us? Oh, um, I think, and I don't know if that just goes to hunters, hound hunters as much, but um, deer hunters, steel hunters, uh, they don't like a lot of us, and we're just out there doing our thing. Uh, they're trying to do their thing. Um, like, like I said, I don't even shoot the game. The dogs catch it or we don't get the game, you know. Um, and we're not running deer. We're off the edge of the earth. Uh, you know, we're just out there trying to have a good time uh, doing our sport. And um, in deer season, I try to leave them alone, let them do their thing. Uh, same way as, as anti-hunters or non-hunters, I guess. Uh, a lot of them get aggravated and, and some situations sometimes happens. Uh, you know, I've heard of coyotes uh, running on a old lady's front porch and she come to the door and, and uh, there's a, a, about 15 dogs have a coyote bait and she opens the door and a coyote comes in the house and just some bad deals happen. Mm -hmm. But we're not, that, that's not the norm. And, and we're trying to leave everybody else alone. We're just trying to do our thing. We just enjoy hunting with hounds. And... Uh, I, I want to try to get along with everybody and still do our thing, you know. Well, and you talk about, you know, the deer hunters, because I think, you know, they outnumber all hound hunters three to one. And, you know, you guys are doing predator control. Whether they understand what's going on or not, you know, I, I don't know how many, how many yearlings a, a coyote takes down a year. Uh, I've seen different numbers, so I won't even speculate on what, what they are. But, you know, there it's a tremendous amount of game that, that coyotes take. Um, you know, it's just like bear. I mean, bear do the same thing. <clears throat> you know, it's like the coon hunters. You know, you guys that like to turkey hunt, the coon hunters are, are – for every coon they take, they're saving probably a batch of your eggs for the spring, yeah. you know, for the hens laying. So, you know – Hound hunters mostly hunt predators, right? And right, right. you know that not not all, but most. And you know, we all we all have to understand that you love to do what you do. I love to do what I do. I want everybody to enjoy the outdoors, and you know that's something that we don't do enough is kind of educate each other and have an open mind and understanding. Like I said, I. I don't like coyotes at all, and I don't have nothing against them. Like, I just don't like them. <laughs> I don't want my dogs right. running them either. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> and I've never told right. them to. It's like, God, what do y'all do this for? <clears throat> and it's funny. Um, I interviewed a guy from uh, Western PA, uh, Brent Hilliard, and one of my dogs, he'll rig a coyote. I've never, I've never purposely had him on a coyote, ever. And he, he'll rig a coyote, but when he rigs a coyote, you can tell there's a distinct difference in his voice. He sounds angry when he barks. Like, he has that, I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, it's just an anger coming out of him. And I know immediately, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, coyote, and I just keep driving. You know, I don't even put him down. And it's so weird that, you know, that he has that distinguished bark, um, on a coyote when he's on a bear he's got a more hollow you know like a bell or just a boo instead of that ah like a scream um right. but it's funny but uh yeah i don't want my dogs running them and i have problems with them and don't ask them to have problems with them. you're having problems with coon i got problems with coyotes <laughs> right right i get that every pound or dog guy has a problem with something probably because none of them are perfect <laughs> yeah <clears throat> no that they are sure are they're not but i really appreciate your time i really appreciate appreciate you enlighten us um like i said it's always a learning lesson especially when it's outside of my wheelhouse i know dogs but i don't you know i don't i don't i don't have running dogs i've ordered dogs over you know the last 20 years um that's mixed i had i got a dog from idaho that was mixed up with july um 
It did not have the speed I was expecting, so I think it took more to the other side um, than what I had. And, you know, we've had a few trig mi mixed in. Um, and, I, you know, I know there's more, more types of running dogs, but, yeah, I mean, I like the speed that I have out of my now. I do. Um, I like the determination. You know, you talked about gaminess, and, I, you know, I don't know if it's coming from the, the walker side of it or – the running dog side of it, but those two dogs especially are extremely gamey. Um, my little female really don't have no quit in her. And um, she, when she was younger, she'd get tore up here and there. She's getting smarter now that she's getting a little older. Um, but I, I can see some of the things that you're talking about, even though I've, I've, I'm hunting the, 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 the treeing part, whether it be, you know, walker or, black and tan or blue tick or whatever whatever it is plot <clears throat> like i can see some of those traits in the dogs the running dogs like you were explaining right well and and hunting uh walker dogs versus julys um you have good and bad in both breeds mm -hmm. you have you know uh the julys used to be known when i was a kid as being the faster breed now that the three hour hunts have become popular They've bred the faster walkers, um, so so I think you're going to see similarities uh, within every hound. Uh, uh, like you're going to have gamey bear dogs, or maybe not as gamey bear dogs, depending on where they came from and who had them and and how they were bred. And the same way with with running dogs, you're going to have uh, fast, slow, uh, good and bad in in all breeds. I think mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and it's you know it's our job to to breed better genetics, to breed better, better hound, top quality hounds. I mean, I think that's, that's a responsibility of all hound owners, um, is, yeah. is to, to breed best to best, better to better. Right. So. Not necessarily handy to ready. Yeah. <clears throat> right. That's, that's exactly right. And man, you know, so many people do that, you know, so we, we, you know, I've had numerous podcasts about, you know, breeding quality and, you know, how, what to look for and things to do. And, you know, we still have, you know, our buddies that, Oh, Hey, I got a female back here. You want to breed old Joe to him? Uh, you know, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, sometimes yeah, you I think uh, over, well, overall, uh, a <clears throat> lot of running dog guys keep a lot of dogs. I'm, I'm talking, some of them will keep 70 head you know, or more. And I try to keep six to eight heads. So, when I breed, I, I need to really watch not only how good is the daddy, how good is the mom, but how good was the family on both sides? Where, where, what were the weak points on both sides? Mm -hmm. And um, I have a, a lot of luck breeding and getting a, a litter of good puppies, you know. And and I don't raise dogs to sell. I, I when I raise a litter, normally I'll keep them all at least until they're old enough to decide if. Oh, I don't like him, but you know, he's, he's good enough. I think somebody should have him. I might sell that dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm not into that 70 to a hundred dogs, especially the price of dog food now. Yeah. You're not kidding. I know the feel. I can't, I can't do it. And I got double what you have and it still kills me. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing your world with us. And like we always say in each podcast, thank you for helping us teach, train, and learn.